What is the mind? Of the thousands of pages devoted to this question, no one can explain how consciousness and the sense of oneself as a mind can emerge from three pounds of gelatinous pudding inside our skull. How is it that an organ made of basically the same material of mitochondria-filled cells as, say, your liver, is able to generate consciousness, thoughts, and the sense of the mind? What is this sense of oneself as a mind? Nothing is harder than the problem of consciousness and mind. But what if we have it all wrong? What if the problem exists because we're looking at it from the wrong angle? What if the reason we cannot explain how brain processes could produce the mind is because the brain doesn't produce the mind? In fact, a large amount of research suggests this is not only true, but that the mind is actively able to change the chemical makeup of the brain. It was neuroscientist Wilder Penfield who began to discover hints of this decades ago. Applying an electrode to the motor cortex, he could force patients to do several things involuntarily. He could raise arms involuntarily, even vocalize, as well as recall memories. But in his studies, he could not involuntarily force patients to act. In other words, he could not stimulate the will. There is no place in the cerebral cortex where an electrical stimulation will cause a patient to decide. Penfield concluded that there was a causal force missing, which could not be explained from brain chemistry alone. He argued the mind was not in the brain chemistry and cannot be explained by it. But this is not the only thing missing in brain chemistry. Another problem that has plagued neuroscience is how unified perceptions emerge. For example, different parts of the brain store information about the color of an object, and different parts store information about the shape of an object. Yet there is no place where the brain combines this information into a unified perception. This is called the visual binding problem. Where do brains combine information to form one unified perception, like we subjectively experience in reality? In 2013, a peer-reviewed study published in the Journal of Cognitive Neurodynamics titled The Neural Binding Problem demonstrated from various studies that the visual systems of the brain had been completely mapped and there was no place it could be responsible for unifying perceptions. This is not to say it simply hasn't been found yet. Instead, researchers noted the entire visual system was mapped and no area could potentially cause subjective experience by unifying perceptions. To quote the study directly, there is now overwhelming biological and behavioral evidence that the brain contains no stable, high-resolution, full-field representation of a visual scene, even though that is what we subjectively experience. The structure of the primate visual system has been mapped in detail, and there is no area that could encode this detailed information. The subjective experience is thus inconsistent with the neural circuitry. With the entire visual system mapped, we can clearly see the brain chemistry cannot give rise to unified subjective experience and cannot explain how our experiences emerge. The core issue of the mind, our subjective experience, cannot be explained by looking at the brain alone. Thus, we cannot conclude the brain gives rise to the mind if it cannot be responsible for subjective experience and unified perceptions. But not only does modern science show the brain chemistry cannot fully explain subjective experience and decision making, but that mental force has real discernible effects on brain chemistry. There is a large amount of research which shows mental efforts can and do change the chemical makeup of the brain. Instead of the brain manipulating the mind, the mind is able to manipulate the brain. In 2006, a study was published which argued our subjective experience of interacting with other people's faces modifies the face perception neurons in the receiver's brain. The subjective experience we have can cause real physical changes in the brain. So our experiences are shaping brain chemistry. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Dozens of studies from the 1980s to the present suggest the mind remains plastic throughout life and can be modified. Dozens of studies from various researchers, ranging from experiments on animals to working with stroke victims and patients suffering from dyslexia, suggest the brain is plastic and can be remapped and changed. In a 2001 study, for example, stroke victims, some who had been living over 17 years with disabilities, underwent constrained-induced movement therapy, and it had created cortical remapping in the brain. There is so much on this topic, it is impossible to go over it all. We are not slaves to genetics or brain chemistry, but actively able to change it through willpower and effort. This is most obvious in the work of neuroscientist Jeffrey Schwartz, who published studies working with OCD patients and demonstrated how mental effort can rewire brain chemistry. From brain scans, Schwartz found that certain parts of the brain displayed abnormal activity. However, he would then have his OCD patients engage in intense mental effort and focusing through what he labeled as relabeling, reattributing, refocusing, and revaluing. 
He found that patients who underwent his mental focusing therapy experienced considerable relief from OCD symptoms, but also their brain scans indicated a realignment of the abnormal brain activity. Without any external intervention, OCD patients were directly able to reorganize and change their brain patterns by intentionally modifying their behavior and thoughts. But most importantly, the changes in the brain resulted from what Schwartz called mindful attention. Conscious and powerful thoughts change and modify the brain. The mind is capable of manipulating the brain and creating the person we want to be. Schwartz is not alone in his research though. Other researchers have found direct mental effort can produce systematic changes in brain functioning, and that with training and effort, patients can alter neural circuitry. As neuroscientist Mrzenich and DeCharms concluded, this leaves us with a clear physiological fact. Moment by moment, we choose and sculpt how our ever-changing minds will work. We choose who we will be in the next moment, in a very real sense, and these choices are left embossed in a physical form on our material selves. The obvious objection to this is that why can't the same thing be demonstrated with external passive stimulation instead of internal mental focusing? However, Schwartz anticipates this and cites a study from 1993 where neuroscientists demonstrated that passive stimulation alone simply cannot mimic the same results. Schwartz says, when stimuli identical to those that induce plastic changes in an attending brain are instead delivered to a non-attending brain, there is no induction of cortical plasticity. Attention, in other words, must be paid. Looking at all this research, it might be logical to suggest the mind is a completely different substance from the brain. But despite this, we cannot ignore the large amount of research which shows physically affecting the brain will create systematic changes to our mental self. A large amount of neuroscience demonstrates the things we attribute to the mind, like personality and moral judgment, can be systematically changed through brain damage and alterations. Neuroscientists know all too well of Phineas Gage, who through a railroad accident had an iron rod forced through his cheek and out the top of his head. Although he survived the accident and experienced no drop in intelligence or cognitive abilities, his entire personality changed. Malcolm Jeeves says, beforehand, he was conscientious, reliable, dependable, hardworking, and a pillar of society. After the accident, while his cognitive functions such as memory and language were virtually unchanged, his personality changed drastically. He was now totally unreliable, boastful, a gambler, and unable to devote himself consistently for any length of time to a particular task. There is also the evidence of frontal temporal disorder. Damage to a certain area of the brain can result in behavioral alterations, such as verbal disinhibits, antisocial behavior, and loss of concern for others. It can even cause changes in political ideology and patterns of dress. In 1999, Tony DiMazio documented in Natural Neuroscience cases of one male and one female who experienced brain damage to certain regions and displayed disruptive and reckless behavior because of it. Brain damage can alter personality, memories, desires, ideologies, moral judgments, and more. If the mind is not created by the brain and is a separate substance, how can we explain how brain damage can alter and change the composition of the mind? But if the brain does not produce the mind, how can we explain how the mind is actively able to affect and change the chemistry and pathways of the brain? It seems as if both can affect and alter the other. But given the options of dualism and physicalism, neither can fully satisfy both sides of the evidence. If the mind is just the effects and creation of the brain, it should be completely subject to the physical brain activity. But if the mind is a separate substance, the properties of the mind should be preserved from physical damage. If the physical can damage the mind, then they share common properties and are not separate substances after all. Can we find a theory which can explain all this data? Given the options of substance dualism and physicalism, neither of which can fully explain the evidence, a third option of idealism can. Instead of the mind being a separate substance or an illusion of brain chemistry, the mind is what is fundamental and the brain is an emergent construct of the mind. This means we can explain how the mind is able to causally affect aspects of the brain while not being ontologically separate. The mind is able to mold itself through conscious efforts and produce real effects perceived in the brain. But the physical emergent brain is not in a separate world, because if idealism is true, then monism is true. So meddling with the brain is not a separate substance from the mind. Brain damage and alterations make sense in idealism. The philosophy boils down to the idea there is a mind and the experience of reality, which we call the physical world, but would essentially just be information and experiences the mind interprets and processes. 
This would be a dual aspect idealism in a sense, instead of a substance dualism. So the information loss or alteration will affect how the mind processes and functions in the experience of reality. For example, if I fall off a building, I'll experience injury. I won't say it is just information and will not affect me. The information is real to the mind and affects how the mind functions in its experience. Think of that line from The Matrix. I thought it wasn't real. Your mind makes it real. Keith Ward explains it like this in advocating dual aspect idealism. We can thus say that the mind reads or interprets the configuration of neurons which store information that the brain has received from its environment. They may then influence this configuration by thought and further experience. The configuration is stored in the brain as a symphony is stored on a CD and is ready to be read again, remembered, at a later time. The way of putting the matter requires that the brain functions properly. Configurations and interpretations can go wrong, and if the physical basis is blocked or damaged, they will go wrong. So it is not at all surprising that brain damage will cause predictable mental defects, or that particular mental processes are often found to be localized in specific regions of the brain. So we have all these correlations, we think the brain causes consciousness, and we're clueless, as Long again pointed out, we're clueless to get a theory about how it could be. Uh, <clears throat> so I am saying that those correlations can have the different direction of causation. Consciousness causes the physical world in the manner that I've described. And in particular, consciousness creates all the objects we see around us, including the brain. Now here's the <clears throat> radical implication of this. The brain has no causal powers. If it's just a symbol created by a conscious agent, then the brain itself, although there are, all, there are all these neural correlates of consciousness, they don't indicate that the brain has the causal powers, it's rather that consciousness um, is creating the symbol that we call the brain as it interacts with other conscious agents. So it's a dumbed-down user interface symbol to represent a very complicated interaction between conscious agents. And this explanation of the mind-brain problem is almost identical to the philosophical implications of what we see in the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Matter is not fundamentally real, but emerges from underlying quantum information upon measurement. Our observations cause the classical world we experience to emerge, which correlates nicely to what we see in neuroscience. All the pieces are coming together, and a new picture of reality and ourselves is emerging. We are not soulless zombies, enslaved to the physical workings of the brain. The mind is an active and real force to be reckoned with, but this does not imply dualism. As Paul Davies and John Gribben close their book The Matter Myth, today, on the brink of the 21st century, we can see that it was right to dismiss the notion of the ghost in the machine, not because there is no ghost, but because there is no machine.